Hello, today we're going to do the first in what I hope to be a series of interviews with comic book professionals. Uh, not just artists and writers, but uh, hopefully publishers and retailers and maybe even someone from the distribution level. Today, we're going to talk to my good friend Mick Gray, Eisner Award winning inker for DC Comics. He's been working since 1989. He's worked on too many projects to name. Um, but of note, he was the inker of J.H. Williams on Alan Moore's Promethea and did the uh, uh, inks over Lieber Mayho on the Joker graphic novel written by uh, Brian Azzarello. So if those two alone don't make him a top tier talent, I don't know what would. So without further ado, let's go hear it straight from the horse's mouth and talk to uh, Mick Gray about what it means to be an inker today, uh, yesterday, and maybe in the future. Mick Gray, welcome to Comic Book News. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be here. So, um, Mick, we've known each other now for decades, like literally I since I was crazy. 11 years old, working at Mike's Coliseum in San Jose. And, and <laughs> why don't you like, like, tell us a little bit about your like history in, in, um, in, in comics in general and in the industry. Yeah. Well, I, um, I never knew I was going to be a comic book artist. I, Went to school as a technical illustrator, went to, got a degree in technical illustration in, uh, um, at Mission College, um, and started my own business doing that. Um, did it for 10 years, and then met Dan Votto at Slave Labor Graphics, and he was in need of somebody to help out doing backgrounds and things like that. And so I, was, I thought, oh boy, that would be fun. I don't think I could make any money at that, but I mean, it should be fun. And so when I got involved with him, uh, working on uh, with Chuck Austin and Alex Shakeman and Norman Felkley, um, that snowballed and he sold a book called The Griffin to DC Comics. And then I was like, wait a minute, this is this is looking big, you know, and the guy they wanted to redo that book completely. They wanted to start from scratch. So they said, Norman, repencil. Um, and we're going to bring a, an inker, one of our veteran inkers on to ink it. And that guy was Mark McKenna, who calls me up 3,000 miles away and says, hey, I saw your name as an assistant on the Griffin. Would you be interested in assisting me on the new version? And I go, how do we do that? You're in New Jersey. I'm in California. And he goes, well, I just stick it art in a FedEx box every day and send it to you. And I was like, oh, my God, that sounds scary. But after a while, I figured out that's, I think we were keeping FedEx in business, the comic book industry, sending art around the world every day, you know? And so that worked for, I worked with him as his assistant for eight years. And in the meantime, going, ooh, if I could, if he needs an assistant, maybe there's other artists. So I went to conventions, met other people, Ian Aiken, Randy Emberlin, uh, like I say, Chuck Austin. Uh, at one point, I was probably assisting five different pencilers and inkers and uh that got me m more chops you know for doing especially mark mckenna he was the and frank sirocco too is one of the first guys that let me ink him and that was very important to me uh, so all he, these names that you brought up there are like san jose comic book scene staples right it like it was it was the san jose comic book scene and i got into it and, the, well, and, and and there was no bigger impact in the scene during that time then uh, the Griffin getting picked up by DC, right? I, I bought the slave labor issues as yeah. it because this was a superhero comic that took place in my hometown of San Jose. Exactly. Light rail battles and everything else. And then Smashing when it got the convention center, yeah. And when it got picked up by DC and went to a prestige format miniseries, yeah. I, that was kind of a mind blower for it me. It was, for uh, us too, you yeah. know? Right, well, Dan Votto, right? He was like the nexus. He was, if you look at the San, that San Jose comic book scene of the 80s and, yep. in, in, and all the way up through the, through now even, he's yeah. a staple of like San Jose as a cultural scene, a little less on the comic side now, a little more on the music side. But, exactly. But man, that guy is another one that I interviewed on my old radio show along with you wow. 10 years ago. Um. And it's just another guy that was just like so important to, to, to comic books in San Jose. 
in, in the South Bay. He was my, he was the guy. I mean, every, every time I talk about my career, I have to, you know, say, I have to say thank you to Dan Votto for giving me that opportunity to do something that I had never done before. I never thought I was a comic book artist. I was just this technical guy that could do cars and buildings and stuff. And he gave me the opportunity to run with that and then meet the other people. Well, that, um, that's awesome. I want to go back a little bit, though. Okay. I want to take it back to before that. So okay. I have this sort of set of questions that I, like, that I want to try to ask, you know, comic book professionals. Yeah. And among comic book professionals, I include artists like yourself, uh, publishers like, like Dan Votto, yeah. uh, retailers like I used to be, and like, you know, so many people that I know. Um, and we all, though, the, the common thread amongst those comics professionals, right, is that... Um, something happened early on it turned them on to comics because oh, yeah. there's a lot of ways to make money in this world comic books is not the easiest fastest no. <laughs> not at all. it's got to so, be a labor of love so what was your first introduction just to comics what's the well, first when i was a kid i loved them um i was more i didn't read them that much but i loved to like cut them up and make collages i mean i did a lot of things like that and then i would mimic you know, the art in them and stuff. I would try to, um, you know, do it. But I mean, it, I was such a realist. I went, no way. I'm not even going to try it. I started drafting when I was 12. My dad, my dad built me a drafting board <laughs> and made me tools. He was working in a sign shop at the time and he built the stuff for me. And I just started getting drafting books out of the library and learning how to do that kind of stuff. So when I hit 16, I was working in the Silicon Valley. I already knew it all. I had already taken regional occupational programs and stuff. Yeah, but, but who makes who makes money with technical exactly. stuff in, in the Bay Area? <laughs> well, right? Why weird, would you want to do that? That was a weird time to get a degree in technical illustration because I got a degree using technical pens, went back and visited my instructors the next semester at Mission College and they had banks of computers. And I yeah. said, What's this? <laughs> He goes, oh, you missed that by a semester. So a complete, you know, three years in college and what I got a degree in is using a technical pen, you know? Which right. Kind of well, helped me in, in comics. I, I want to say that not only did, was that like, I don't know, kismet or fate, like setting you on Maybe the Maybe you're to, right. It was supposed not, to be. But also the rigor of technical art being artistic and requiring skill, but requiring like deadlines, pressure yeah. and attention to detail and a high bar of professionalism. So true. It made me who I am. And, you know, I teach comic book inking at the Academy of Art University. And I, that's the most important thing that I teach them is that professionalism and that, and that caring about every line you put down. And I, you know, cause as an anchor, I don't have that much to teach them. I can show them the nice thing about the classes. They can see my hand move and how I do it and stuff, but they're all doing it digital. So it's like, what are you doing for these 15 weeks in my class? You're learning what I know, how I am, how I, uh, you know, treat the industry, treat my, the people I work with, how I deal professionally with people. It's, it's all more of that than really much else that I can teach. I can say things like, now that you've done 15 weeks by hand, you know what brushes to look for on your Cintiq right. pad and things like that. So it's nice. Teach um, a little tricks, back, like toothbrush tricks and stuff all and that i show them all that you know me i'm i'm a big splatter guy so i have to show them all my little tricks to um how i how i use that kind of stuff textures and stuff of course are very important um and then you have to relate that to your digital platform you know uh, so i just I, wanted to go I, back I, I, i'm I sorry to but go I, back I, and say because we were talking I, I i'll forget this if we don't yeah, yeah. Uh, when i was a kid yes i can't remember what issue it was but it was batman one of the big, uh, thick, you know, 80 pagers, and you open it up, and it was the Batcave cutaway, and you saw everything in the Batcave. M the most influential piece of art I ever saw in my life, you know? I, I mean, something to me, maybe, is you can you can Exactly. Tell. So but that was, I can't say anything else um, in comics as a kid that stuck with me so importantly was, and it relates to both sides, right? It's that technical illustration of the Batcave, and it's also, you know, my favorite character, so. Right, interesting that that was more like a technical illustration, really. It was. Personally, I used to really get off on the um, stuff in the uh, handbook to the Marvel Universe where they, you know, they draw the Quinjet and they do yeah. a, 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 
technical drawing of Captain America's shield or Spider-Man's web shooters and things like that. That There's, to me drew, drew, drew Exactly. Me. Same thing with me. That's my, that was what got me into technical illustration. And if you think about it, when you are drawing technical illustrations of things that don't exist, they now exist. Right. You've well, just made them real to the reader. Right. You know, it's such a cool thing. It's such a cool thing. It's a, so, so where I was trying to get to with the first question, first question that you circled right back into is like, so do you, like the core of it all is like Batman. Like yeah. that, led to, that led to comics. And how many people is that the one word answer for, right? Um, yep, it's, it's wow. the most important. Yeah, I mean, it, it was so crazy from the get-go, from, from 10 years old, maybe younger, you know, that was the character to me. And to this day, it's still... There's no character that's more important to me. You know, I, I wish I could work on Batman every day. <laughs> well, you've put in quite a few years on the character, and we'll talk about that in a second. Yes. So it's almost worse that I've that I've put in so many years in it, and I'm not working in it anymore. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy in the world of Batman comics right now. Uh, really? As you're probably seeing. Um, oh, I, yeah, I don't know that much about it. I don't, I'm not, I don't keep my, my ear on it. People think, always oh, ask me, like uh, the other day, somebody, there was some news about uh, um, uh, Vertigo, like, going down. Yeah. And people were on Facebook like, do you know anything? I go, are you kidding? I'm an anchor. They don't even tell me if I have a job or not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. So let's talk, that, that's a good segue, because so let's talk about what an anchor is. Okay. Um, you know, we have most, ma almost all mainstream comics up until now, things are changing now a lot, and we'll have to talk about that too, but up until now, as a, as a team, you got the writer, you got the penciler, you got the inker, you got the letterer, and you got the colorist. And the inker is the guy who takes that initial pencil drawing that, that is done, and I try to make it clean, sharp, precise and printable. It's harder these days with a computer, you could scan pencils in, manipulate them with contrast and things like that in Photoshop. And they come out a lot of, they do it these days. But there's something to be said about them. A brush line, a pen line on Bristol board that makes it uh, really pop. And so what are the most important things that an anchor does? Uh, keeps central, uh, keeps thinking about light source, keeps thinking about depth, so that the colorist, he's the last guy that gets the pages after I'm done with it, um, he's gonna be the one that's pushed the most in the deadline situation, because he's the last guy to get it. I want to be clear for him where his light sources are coming from, that I wanna show some depth in the page. Um, I think about foreground, middle ground, background a lot. I ink in that, I, I ink that way. I ink my foreground figures, middle ground figures, and background figures separate so that it, even if it's just in my mind, it separates them and it gives right. you depth on the page. And so, different line values and thicknesses for the layers and things? Yes, yes exactly. You got, you know, you're going to be bolder in the foreground and thinner in the background to keep it. I think that there's, 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 there's a difference between a great penciler and a great inker. And then also oh. there's then the 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 um the cartoonist who does all who does all of those pieces right there yeah. there are those artists as well, and since you brought up coloring, you know inking used to be a lot about uh, modeling and texturing and adding sort of volumetric uh, shape yeah. to these flat pencil drawings, and to some degree that has shifted more towards the colorist for some types of art requiring less ink work, less attached shadows and more in the way of gradient colors and things like that. How do you see the world, the, the technology world, altering the profession of comic book art? Um, in, in me, in general, as an inker, it's pretty much, it's, it's taking away my, I mean, I'm, the first guy that noticed was the letterer. He's the guy that got dumped from the digital technology first all of a sudden a ton of inkers i mean a ton of letterers across the country just lost their jobs because uh, they could do that technically in the office you know right now you're now a font has just replaced uh a human yeah who was working who was putting in serious amounts of hours and time 
and dedicated skill as well. Oh, skill is incredible in lettering. And they just- I feel like that's one area where technology made it easier, but definitely did not elevate uh, the craft nope. in that way. Yeah, and, and there are still great hand letterers like Todd Klein or- They're or, still around. Others. The really great ones are, you know, there's a few of them still around, but there used to be hundreds of them. And then they, now there's barely none. But in inking, the digital ability to digitally manipulate and be able to ink digitally, um, I, I think, this is just my opinion, that pencilers saw that they didn't really have to, that they could do both. If you look at most books now, a lot of them are just an artist inking, penciling and inking himself. And possibly, if they're really good, you know there's guys out there that are this good, they don't even pencil. They just go directly. Right, directly. Digitally. digitally. Yeah. Right. And can so, you spot that? Can you spot, can you look at a drawing and say this was done digitally for the most part, or do you think you can? Sometimes I can, you know, I mean, there's, I, you know, my favorite uh, example of the greatest is uh, my favorite guy, Brian Bolin, who actually changed over. He took six months off, learned the digital platform, and you can't tell the difference between his digital inks to his hand uh, inks. He did that because his eyes weren't doing well, and he was able to digitally uh -huh. blow things up really big. So that's the only guy that I noticed that does it perfectly like what his hand done stuff was. There's probably Well, I mean, that probably comes a lot from his aesthetic being so meticulous to begin with, right? Yes, exactly. And so he was drawn, like people would say, he draws like a machine, you know, anyway, as far as just the... Um, fluidity of the line yeah. and the perfection of his compositions and everything right. else truly an artist artist yeah and that you know he is a genius and he was able to take that six months or eight months or a year or whatever it was and go now i just got i know the, what the lines look like by hand now i just got to find digitally those brushes that are going to achieve that same look you know he man he nailed and it. he nailed it right so that's <laughs> I mean, that tells you right there, those that are take sort of a Luddite position like, you know, oh, you'll never get the line quality. You'll never have uh, stuff done on a computer that's going to look as good as Jack Kirby was banging out or whatever. Not true. Not true. I don't think that's true. There, yeah. You can find life in it, too. You can find life. As long as you can find life in the line, it doesn't matter the tool you're using. Period. And, and, and in many ways, imagine if those genius creators of the past had access to some of the technology, particularly the coloring technology. Can you imagine what we, you know? What we I don't even want to go back to that alternative universe because I wouldn't have had a career probably. <laughs> never I know. wouldn't have existed. I think you would have, Mick. Uh, sure. So let's talk about your career. Um, so we, we heard about your first professional comics gig. We're going to call that the Griffin. Yeah. Um, tell us, just give us, if you will, a professional highlight and or low light. And yeah. I don't mean like, you know, I don't mean that you weren't happy to have a job and didn't learn something from it, but you know, maybe yeah. something that w didn't live up to your expectations about what being a professional comics artist would be. Yeah, well, the, um, the you know, when I started and I've worked with the best people, I've worked with the best artists, I've learned so much. I mean, eight years with J.H. Williams, um, Promethea, uh, lots of different, uh, a book called Chase, uh, lots of different uh, cover uh, fill-ins at DC. He taught me, you know, what, he was such a uh, precise director when you worked with J.H. Williams. He knew exactly what he wanted to see. He, he let you know what he wanted you to do and you went along with it. If it worked that way, then it was fantastic. And just alone, you know, 30 issues of, what do I do with it? I thought I brought it out here. I had, a, I had a copy of Promethea here somewhere. 30 issues of Promethea. Oh my God. By the way, one of my all time favorites and probably like a, just a, a high watermark in the medium, especially for that period of time in comics. Yeah. You know what it's, I mean? That era, the comics that were coming out, Promethea was a completely different animal and, and took storytelling, art, right. and, and ideas just yeah, to that. You know, you know, what made it that way is a couple things. But, you know, Alan Moore 
one of the geniuses, maybe the greatest comic book writer of our time, probably. Um, that was his favorite subject matter, this, this uh, you know, kind of spiritual, uh, deep, esoteric, uh, you know, really interesting storyline that he was doing there about a muse, how a muse affects a writer. You know, this Promethea was a muse, kind of. And so it's his favorite subject matter. So he finds the team that's just as excited as he is to work together. And there's never, ever been an, a creative situation like Promethea that I've worked on in my 30 years, the way that everybody just perfectly meshed together, you know, writer, penciler, colorist, letterer. It was just a perfect mesh. And it, you worked as a team. I Whereas, believe that was Todd Klein, right? As the letterer on that? Yep, yep. And he did things like designed a different l logo for every issue, uh, had different fonts for different um, characters. It was just creativity at its extreme. And I think that's what made it the book that it was. I mean, I've never worked on anything that was just that creative. So, Well, and, and the level career. of... The level of details, I had a feeling that might be up there, but like the level of detail in those pencils. Let's talk inker, let's talk pro inker for a second, right? Yeah. Like sometimes I've heard in the past people, some inkers would complain about various pencils and say there's too much detail there, right. too much work. It's going to take me five times as long to ink this person's page as another. How did J.H. Williams stack up in that type of scenario? And how important is that to you? I mean, obviously you're a professional, you're gonna deliver the highest quality no matter what, but like, wh how does that play into your thinking or your scheduling of your work? Yeah, yeah, well in the case of Promethea, um, Scott Dunbeer, another part of that team who was the greatest editor you could ever wanna have, made it so, and this, is ne this has never happened again, um, but it made it so if we were behind on an issue, he would reschedule it and give us another month or whatever. So unheard of in comics that never happens oh you're not going to get this done on time okay we're gonna have to give that stuff to another inker that's the way the world works in comics but mm -hmm. in the case of promethea we just did it we did it the way we wanted it so the question of it of there being a lot of detail in it yes there was and it was labor of love intensity um but we had the time to put the labor of love into it um in the case of all the rest of my career it's always oh I, I'm going to do the best possible work I can do, but it's got to be done tomorrow. That's my whole life. Yeah. Creative Creativity to its extreme, got to be done tomorrow. That's what I'm weighing all the time. Promethea was the only book that I, that I didn't do that on. That's pretty awesome. And Actually, the <laughs> Joker book, too. Um, ah, which another just, high watermark in, 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 in my it mind. Just, it just came it. out in paperback for the first time ever. Great. This is... Uh, this is the first time this book has ever been out in paperback, came out in 2008. And that was another one that we worked on for two years. The, and that was also with Scott Dunbeer, um, where it was like, we won't solicit this until you guys are done. And you guys just, we, I just worked on it because it was extreme detail, really labor intensive. Right. And maybe more labor intensive than JH's stuff, but, but Lee Bermejo was a fanatical, he loved, uh, he loves architecture and stuff. So you're doing a lot of buildings and things like that. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, that was extreme, um, but we had the time. Yeah. Now, I, I know, if you yeah. want to go to the other end of it, the way things are real in real life, those aren't real life scenarios. Those are labor of love scenarios. Um, I prefer to do simple art any day. Give me stuff that, isn't overly rendered. Give me stuff that doesn't have massive backgrounds. I am 60, you know, almost 60 years old. So it's not like I want to sit here laboring, you know, I have to work. So I'm not going to turn down, you know, work, but I mean. Well, is that from a, from a workload standpoint or from an aesthetic standpoint? Like it's what? kind of, it's kind of both because I am my favorite real, I love like animated style stuff. You know, I love that look. Um, so. I never get, I've only done a couple books like that, you know, Teen Titans Go and Justice League Adventures, a couple of them. And so when it's less, when it's bolder art, I like that the most. Um, 
but I don't get that very much. So I have to, I have to be, I try to be a chameleon that captures a penciler's style, no matter if it's simple, really um, complex or whatever, but I'm not really a crosshatchy guy. I don't, I don't really, I can do it, but I don't really like to sit around all day crosshatching tones on, on art. I like more linear stuff, you know? Right. Um, my preference. Uh, like what's, so do you have, we talked just now about some of your favorite collaborators. We've talked throughout this uh, interview about it, but do you have a, do you have a dream project or a dream team or a concept of like, man, I'd really like to work on this character with this writer and this penciler? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many, I love, I love so many artists. I mean, I always loved Steve Rude. Steve Rude is probably always one of my favorite artists. I just love his style. And I know he inks himself and everything, but I've always, I think in almost every interview, I would say, hey, Steve, if you ever. ever that fits to... everything that you just said about the type of style that you like, too. That's Steve, it. That's, he's, my, he's the look I like, you know. There's no cross hat. There's not a lot of, if any, cross hatching, right? It's just a beautifully rendered line. Yes. Yeah, and the other guy is a guy that I've worked with that I that I just love. He's one of my one of my oldest and favorite guy fa favorite friends I have um, is Ryan Sook, and I would work on any project with Ryan Sook. He's another guy that's I most all the pencilers I've worked with they ink themselves now because they're great. J. H. Williams does painting more than inking, you know, and penciling now. Uh, Ryan's inking himself. Uh, a lot of the guys that are great do that, but I always tell. You know, Ryan, hey, if you ever want, do a nice, if you get a big prestige book and you want to want to just lay back on the pencils. But a lot of these guys, when you get really great, you don't have to lay down the finished pencils yes. that an inker needs to see. They can go, a really good guy like J.H. Williams or Ryan Sook can go relatively rough with pencils and then he knows exactly what he wants with ink and he can lay it right over top. So right. it saves him time, doubles his rate. He's getting pencil and inker rate, you know? And I, I think if you look at, uh, he, oh, so he gets double the rate. He gets paid as an inker as well. So that's an incentive I would think too. That's why, it, that's why it's a lot of it's, you know, leaving my hands, you know? That's a shame. I don't like hearing that, Nick. Nope. I, well, you know, if you want to go into it a little bit, I've lost, I don't know. I mean, I've been busy over the, over the last year or so. Um, there's a Batgirl cover that I did over uh, Emma Lupacino. Uh, did about six issues of Wonder Woman over Carrie Nord. Um, Titans issue over Joe Bennett. No. Funny because Carrie Nord was one of those guys I remember from Conan. He was one of those guys who was going straight from pencil to the finished page, as I remember. Yeah, and he, and he's changed. He's went digital. Um, uh, and he, it's actually, he was actually, when I was working with him, doing a different style, more of an animated looking style, too, on the Wonder Woman stuff. Uh, but in the middle of our six issues, he went digital pencils. So that was an interesting thing to watch, where he was learning his uh, ability on the Cintiq pad to, to get his lines and stuff. And it, it's a weird situation these days where if you're getting a guy giving you digital pencils, sometimes you get a job that you go, this looks done. What do you need me for? How is that delivered to you? Do they print it out or do you get a digital file and digitally ink it? Yeah, or what? Every, everything's uh, digital uh, files now. We don't, I don't but work. But how do you ink digitally or do you? Uh, no, I, um, I take the digital file, pencil files. Um, I take it, put it in uh, Photoshop, transfer it to a light blue and I print it out on Bristol board. So I, I, I'm still inking on Bristol board as just like the old days. And, but I'm just inking on digital, a uh, blue, blue line print of the pencils now. Um, and so that saves a lot of time. No more waiting for FedEx to deliver original art. Um, also, if you think about the confidence level, um, if you're inking over somebody's beautiful original pencils, you may be a little leery on, oh, it, I hope I don't ruin these because he's yes. going to be really pissed. Now, 
yeah, of course, I, I, I try not to make any mistakes at all, ever. So it's like, I don't redo a page very often, but it's always in the back of your mind. Well, if I blow this, I could redo the page. Sure. Shoots I mean, I would think too. Level, shoots the confidence level through the roof, and that's what makes your lines more alive, is being confident. Ah, ah, ah. interesting. The most important thing in inking is having uh, a confident uh, line that you're not tentative. You go to, oh, yes. God, I hope. I hope I can do this right. No, you don't want that. You want it slick, alive. You know? I never thought about that. Imagine the pressure of inking a, like a Jack Kirby, oh. right? Or like, a, or, or so many, so many people. Or yeah. Claus Jansen inking over Frank Miller or something like that, yeah. right? And Yeah, I, I, through my career, it was so scary, especially in the early days, you know? Um, you know, I, I inked uh, Steve Ditko and I inked Kirby both on pencils, Amazing. you know? Amazing. Amazing. I didn't know that you ain't Kirby. Just tiny little things, you know. I mean, that's a, a long story on the piece on Kirby, but it's but it was in uh, Phantom Force, a, a splash page in Phantom Force. And that thing sat in my studio for six months before I could get up enough nerve to even hit it. And that was even before, you know, like there was a point with Jack Kirby art where everybody went, we don't ink his pencils anymore. Right? It was like at one point they just said, you don't ink them. You just make a copy of them and you ink them. Ah, I see. And so I just inked the damn thing. You know? Nice. But nice. Like I say, it took me six months to get enough nerve to do it. You know. Wait, they might be coming for you. Oh, God. <laughs> they heard you inked directly on Kirby. <laughs> it's the Kirby police. Okay, so, you know, we've gone through my list except for one. I got one final question before we go to uh, the game portion. Oh, of, yes. Uh, program. So. Um, we talked about your uh, a potential dream project would be maybe something original, something with Ryan Sook or one of the people that you've loved and worked with before. Who are your artistic heroes? Just apart from working with them, like when you read comics or you go to the comic shop or wherever, who do you look for? Who is your favorite? Who really turns you on? Well, I think Jack Kirby, we call him the king of the com king of comics. And I think he was, I mean, I think he was, I always think of Jack Kirby as kind of, abstract in a way he you know people look at jack kirby and they go oh my god his anatomy is his weird. hands yeah weird you know but i mean his dynamics he made comics comics to me and i kind of like the idea of being abstract like you know that 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 feel really made it pop off the page and jump off the page he's my favorite um steve rude uh uh, spiritual successor almost right yeah i mean brian bolin i love brian bolin incredibly um there, there's so many of them i mean i can't even you know begin to list them because i'm i'm a very open-minded person and I, it never it doesn't bother me you know i love you know frank miller's uh, dark knight return i think that was just a turning point in comics you know when he did that him and klaus jansen were a perfect fit you know and Lynn Varley yeah. on Colors. Oh. I, just, I just watched a special about that on the Comics Kayfabe channel I was mentioning yeah. before that, yeah. where they said how Lynn Varley's contribution cannot be underestimated. Without the coloring, the breakthrough coloring that she did on that book, it might not have worked. That it really was. It was really another one of those perfect, and it, does, it doesn't happen that often, but the perfect combination of a team. And it was just perfect timing. Everything about it was perfect. And that, you know, I love that. I love, uh, I love, you know, back in, you know, when I got into comics big time was about at that point, Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns, Crisis on Infinite Earth. Those were the ones, you know, that I went. Mid 80s. I, was buying, I wasn't buying a lot before that. And then all of a sudden a $30 a week habit, you know? So I was buying a lot when that hit. And you know, George Perez is another one, you know, Crisis on Infinite Earth, just the amazing complexity and the the detail to his art always blew me away. And uh, that, you know, all those guys in that period, you know, all the indie stuff that was coming out around that time, it was crazy. You know, all these, everything was like starting, it was like a real resurgence at that point. And I loved all of that stuff. I, like I say, $30 a week habit in you know, yeah. 1985, 1986. So it was like. So 86 was the year I started working at the comic book store. Yeah. And in my mind, that is the time, like the, the, the mid 80s is when comics 
officially made their turn, even if they hadn't in the public mainstream mind yeah. of like, these are not just for kids. I don't care that it's Batman. You can write a story about Batman that uh, is not meant for children and, and oh, yeah. but can, ap- can appeal on multiple levels to a yeah. sophisticated audience. Oh, such a changing point, such a turning point in it all. And the creativity level was through the roof in those well, days. Not just the creativity level, though, but the professionalism and, and, and the quality of the workmanship, right? Like the actual work by George Perez and Dave Gibbons and, and, and Frank Miller and whatever, it was such a highly elevated level of craft that took everything from before it and said, We're, we, we've learned those lessons, now let's try something new with our skills yeah. and just broke the art form wide open in my opinion. So true, it was a, it was a great time, man. Okay, Mick. Now is a great time. To play okay. Game. Okay. So I appreciate you're the first one to ever do a game with me on, on one of these things. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I got 20 images to show you. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see how good I am. Let's see. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. You see what I'm, I'm laying down here? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, we're going to start pretty easy. I'm just going to go rapid fire. Why don't you try to go as quickly as possible? Who, who's yep. this? Frank Miller. Okay. And uh, Robert Crumb. Just because you showed me that ass, I knew that. Subject matter is, is going to be a clue in some of these. <laughs> oh, this is, man, I want, I think they're coming out with an artist edition of this. And I'm going to go out and, I mean, I buy a lot of artist editions anyways before my uh, inking class because it's the best way for them to see it. But to have mm-hmm. Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein in artist edition size, is going to be very important to me. Absolutely. Um, uh, 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 Oops. I this is not this. a good, this subject matter wise, some of them I picked to be a little like not what the picture you'd see them draw the most, right? So Yes. This isn't. Um, and feel free to say pass if you want to come back to any of these. Yes, pass. Okay. Uh, Will Eisner. That looks familiar too. Um, pass. Oh, a, this, this yes, I had this book. This is a tricky one. I had this. I'm, why am I blanking on it? Uh, pass. We'll come back. Yeah. I'm getting obscure, Mick. Yeah, and that's a close-up too, man. That looks. Uh, oh, I was, jeez, I can't think, Sienkiewicz? Eddie Campbell. Oh, Eddie Campbell, yes. Oh, now this guy is my favorite, really one of my favorite inkers, and he, he, I was up against him for a Eisner, for best inker once, and he won, and I was like, I'm glad he won because he's way better than me. And it's my favorite lines. These lines are so important to me. I love the fades that he does from black to white. Uh-huh. And I am blanking on his name. That's uh, all right. Charles Burns. Charles Burns. Yeah, he actually beat me. And I'm happy. And you're that a winner of how many Eisner Awards, Mick? I forgot uh, to mention. I only one. have one that I won. Uh, that we ha- We won an Eisner for... Promethea issue, issue 10. And so we won for that one single issue. Uh, and But I've been nominated quite a few times, which is always, to me, it's an issue honor. And in the case of this one, was up against the guy that I think is one of the great uh, anchors of all time. He's fantastic. I, well, issue number 10, was that the one where the, with the panel that you could read forwards or backwards? That the uh, um, the Mobius strip panel. Yes. Yeah, I think that was in that issue. I can't I remember. I think it exactly. was. That's my like when I think Promethea, I think of that. Everybody, page. that's an important, really important page. Everybody wanted it. Everybody always asked me, "Do you still have the Mobius strip page?" And it was interesting because I remember when we when I inked it, um, they lettered it afterwards, 
And a lot of discussion went in between Todd and, and JH about where word bubbles would be because they wanted it. Because so there was no, like you say, no start or no end to it. So they, it was amazing. They had to, they played with it for a long time to get that to happen. That one in the Scrabble tiles issue. Oh, yes. That's issue 10. Yeah. That, and that one, every page connects. So if you actually took that book, and ripped a bunch of copies apart, you could actually tape the pages together. I actually would ink, it was all double page spreads, right? So uh -huh. I'd ink a double page spread, and then when I'd start the next one, I'd butt up this two and three to four and five to make sure that the, all the lines fit up. Uh -huh. And then one day I got an email from somebody in Germany, and they said, just wanted to show you what I did. And somebody took all the pages, printed them on transparencies, connected them all up, and the last page connects back to the first oh page. Oh, my gosh. So he hung them from a flagpole in a big circular. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. <laughs> I wish I, I, wish I would have kept the photo. It was amazing. We just went, what? Amazing. All right, Mick, back to the quiz. We're going yes. to get a little more obscure before we get more mainstream, I think. Okay. Oh, this, this one? Mm, that's <laughs> That's really cool. This is one I thought was, was someone you would like. I really like it a lot. Why can't, why, it looks familiar. I know I'll probably go, oh. Yeah, I think you will, you would if I said P. Craig Russell. Oh, God, yeah, and he worked on Promethea with us too. That's what I mean. This is not, like, you're not used to seeing him draw Spider-Man. This is Marvel fanfare or some right. kind of, like, right. Like, that guy that's can a, draw. That's a beautiful piece. Oh, yeah, Peter Bag. And my I love, talk about, talk about abstract. My all-time favorite comic Is book he? artist, creator. I, I, that's, that's, you know, that's Picasso of comics. I, 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 I think so, so much. His sense of design and, and um, it looks like it's not designed, right? But it's so meticulously designed that it's... Yeah. That He's it's a man. guy that if he, if he called and said, hey, I need an anchor, I'd go, I'm there. I love I love that he, style. He's like, used them. He's used them in the past, right? You used Jim Blanchard. Um, wow, oh, I love Jim. God, Jim, Jim is amazing. Jim drew the comic book news pig face logo that you'll see on this video. Yeah, um, I saw that, man. He's so amazing, man. I try to figure out how he gets the textures he gets. He does his... so many tech experimental crazy techniques that are um, just unbelievable. I, I want to get him on the show too. Jaw-dropping. He's another guy that, that's a jaw-dropping illustrator, man. And probably the second nicest guy in comics after Mick Gray. <laughs> I've, talked to Jim, I've talked to Jim a couple times at, at conventions, and he is a great guy, and I, I'm glad that I'm Facebook friends with him at least. Yeah. I, I talk with him uh, every couple of years. Like I said, he did that work for my comic book store. He did the pig yeah. logo, yeah. and I've done, I'm trying to do more with him in the future. I want to get him to do more channel logos and stuff anyway yeah. we're, we're 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 going through our list here oh yes mignola of course right like, I, and i love it what, what a unique guy he is you know i mean is he my favorite style no but i totally appreciate the his design work and the way he like just this alone the way he pops this this yes. for, foreground figure and uh yeah, it's just incredible. And like the, the look of that. I don't know what like it is. The barrel chest and the weird kind of like pose and the almost flatness of, of it. These are almost like cardboard standees, but. Yeah, always weird you know, noses. Noses are weird with him. But it always works. That's It always cool. works. Okay. Hmm. Wood, wood ring, right? Yeah, Jim Woodring, another guy. This seems like you're kind of inconsistent. This is not. And a it is again. You, when you when it comes down to this stuff, that's so. It's precise. It's technical. It's beautiful. And and what we were talking about depth. He he's a master. He's a master. I mean, another guy that, like I said, like you know, we're saying kind of abstract, kind of out there, and but just so wonderful, man. But to combine the abstractness and whatever your line looks like. Really, it's all about storytelling, and it's oh. when the two things come together that you get a master, right? Yep. All right, let's move on. Hmm. 
Hmm, this is going to be a tricky one because you're not seeing any of the any of the characters or anything this guy might be um, associated with. Yeah, that looks very familiar too. One of my favorites. Wait a minute, go back to Dan Vado. Go back to Slave Labor Graphics. Start wow. thinking dairy products, and you might come up with Evan Dorkin. Oh, yes, milk Evan. and cheese. This was a tricky one. Um, I got to hang with Evan a little bit in the in the early days. I like to tell him he was, uh, you know, because he was, you know, he would come down to to uh, work with Dan at times and stuff. And I remember once um, taking him up to San Francisco and driving around, showing him around San Francisco and stuff. He was a trip. Funny right, hanging up on my wall right here is my uh, not convention sketch milk and cheese 1991 wow. i think i paid ten dollars for this in 91 so and mm. what a what a character i mean dorkin is a crazy guy man yeah i had to so i had to sneak him in let's see what else we're almost done here hey there's a more modern superhero guy I, I didn't know if you kept up on these guys or not yes this is um You know his name. It's, it's not Travis Cheris. That's a good guess, though. Really, but, kind of a similar. Uh, but I know who. Who is it? John Cassidy. Yes, John Cassidy. Another guy. Tyler Perry. Never, Astonishing X Men. A couple other cool yeah. things like that. This still, Yeah, Man. just still doing amazing work today. I mean, the, the guy is. Yeah, it's it's some nice stuff. His stuff looks so almost photo referenced, but I go like, I don't think it is, you no. know? Well, it might a little bit, but I mean- A little bit, a little he bit. Uses it, he uses his photo reference really good. Right, and, and yeah, marries it with a design sense and everything else that yeah. was amazing. Okay. Ooh, that's a hard one. Yeah, this is another one of my favorites and another guy with a weird line and a weird style that, undeniably works yeah i love it but i have no clue okay this is from martial law in the 80s kevin o'neill oh yeah who ended up doing league of extraordinary gentlemen that's right that's right with Elmore. Um, really cool piece oh how about this do you like this kind of guy yes i love this guy's art but i don't remember it's tough there's a street in san francisco named after him really in the Richmond yeah. district, not named after him, but with the same name. That's how I remember him. Um, I love this style. And he did those Victorian, uh, Treasury of Victorian murder books and a bunch of other just weird. He does the most out there, like weird um, stuff that you don't normally see in comics. Rick Geary. Oh, yes. Rick Geary. Who actually did another Gumby book, too. Yeah. That's um, a great piece. This is one when I think about inks and I think cross hatching and I think spiritual successor to like Robert Crumb, but maybe even better of an artist. Yeah. I start thinking about um I start thinking yeah. about this. You got me. This is Joe Sacco from Palestine. Yeah. Uh, the book Palestine. Yeah. Um, talk about yeah, that that's fantastic. Now this one is as famous as an artist gets. Yes. But, obscure, Mobius. but an obscure... The Mobius? Yes, it is. This yeah. is from, from and, Blue, right? And, and there's a guy, I think, one of the greatest, you know, because I just like that he went in different directions, did whatever was creative, creative to himself at that moment, what was making him excited, inspired him at that moment. He'd go in so many different directions. I just, I love his stuff, man. What, what I love about his stuff is you look at his science fiction stuff and you go, yeah, okay, it's all coming from his imagination. It's crazy planets, crazy shapes. But then you look at his blueberry stuff and you go, oh man, this is like grounded in, in a, it's a period piece, right? And, yep. it, and it's astoundingly well done. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I love blueberry. Yeah, he's amazing. I, I, I haven't read many of those books, but I just love to look at them. Oh, just, and the colors, the colors alone on them are just yeah. gorgeous. That's one I would like to see new printings of that I could pick up. Yeah. This is another one, the more modern and a weird picture that I chose, but wow. uh, this one's, a, this is probably going to be the toughest. Yeah, I have no idea. 
This is Dave Cooper. Oh, yeah. I don't even know Dave Cooper's work. I think you might. If That's you saw... Pretty- so I'm trying to think what his most fa- anyway, he does children's books as well, which is one reason why I brought him in. But then he does this stuff that is just undeniably like as adult as it gets. Yeah, his books like Crumple, Rump, uh, Ripple, Suckle were just just amazing. Really cool. I like the style. I mean, it's got a cool look to it, man. I'll have to check out his stuff more. Okay, um, so we're gonna. That's it. We're, we're gonna go back to a couple of the ones that we passed on and see what we got here. The so. Gumby one. The Gumby one's bugging me the most, man, because I, oh, yeah. I love oh, yeah. that work. Uh, it- so I, let's give you a hint. Uh, very mainstream superhero comic artist of the '80s. Super influential. Uh, Was it Kevin Nolan? No. Um, think. What did he? What? What can I think? I mean, I'll, almost trying to figure out what the ultimate book for him. Is. Let's just his name starts uh, is he has an alliterative name. Starts both names start with the same letter, and he's I well. Had, I had the Gumby Summer Special. I loved that. The summer, summer, and the Winter Special are two of my favorite single issue comics of all time, yeah. and uh, uh, it's by. Art Adams. Art all- Adams. God, how could have I forgotten that? Well, you could because if I showed you almost any other picture by Art Adams, you're, it would be so distinctive. It would be almost like exactly too easy. Um, and we, we did Eddie Campbell from how? Oh yeah, this Harvey Kurtzman. Harvey Kurtzman. Yeah. But again, oh. because this is a parody of like Archie in this picture, it's not quite his Kurtzman-ish. Yeah. Uh, the minute I saw Archie, I was off. Like, you got me off on that. One. Yeah. Um, yeah, but Mac, you did astoundingly well. I oh, threw you, you know, I, I didn't do too bad. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I that were a couple of them like not remembering Art Adams did that. I, oh I, man, that you, was you, fun. You, <laughs> you know what? I, I mean, you basically. I mean, this quiz is like, do you know Dan's tastes in comics and like? Do you know, <laughs> But hey, that's my, it's my show, so I get to do that. Exactly, and you do great. Exactly. You're the first person to, to uh, play one of our games. And um, I'm hoping we can talk to you again sometime, maybe in the future, if we've got something to promote. Or I anything. tell you, man, yeah, that's right now on the stands. You got uh, uh, Dog Days of Summer. I did 10 pages um, with a new guy by the name of uh, uh, Paul Fry. And he's in his first DC work he's ever did a little deck star story in this, this is on the stands right now. And that's, this was a really fun book because it's all animals, DC animals. And I would work on a DC animals book all day long, every day if he gave it to me. So DC, let's do more DC animal books. There's a bunch of fans of that stuff out there on the Marvel side too, right? Uh, Yeah. uh, Animal side, Lockjaw and and the super pets or whatever. And like Um, I say, the new uh, 20th anniversary of Promethea hardcover just came out. I had a copy of it with me, but I forgot to bring it. Uh, Oh. uh, They've just put uh, uh, some of the Batman and Robin out again, reissued. uh, They're calling it Essential, so they put that out recently. Um, Of course, all the uh, Superman stuff, you know, there's there's over 60 issues. There's about 60 issues of me and Pat Gleason together, so that was a that was a heck of a run we had there between Batman and Robin, Superman, Robin, son of Batman. It's crazy. I Great think Gleason Gray is like a, a classic team up at this point. Of, well, of that's a long run. You think about it. We, when we did this run of almost 60 issues, people weren't doing those kind of runs. That was yeah. kind of in, that was the past, you know. They still and rarely then, do. And then on Amazon, you can get my children's book. It's yeah. still available. I actually have a publisher now. It's, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name of, of my publisher. McLaren Cochran Publishing. She does oh, just awesome. children's book. And she picked this up about, out of the blue, she got in touch with me about, I guess it must be five years ago or something like that. And we put it out as a color uh, version. Oh, so I've never book. seen the color version. Yeah, oh. It was originally just a black and white book because me being an actor. Right. Yeah. But then we had it all covered, colored, and it looks great, and it's available um, in, on Amazon now. So when I think of the purest expression of Mick Gray's art and what is really like, what does Mick draw like, and what does his line look like when it's his decision, I think about that book, 
right? This is the only thing I've ever done. You know, I mean, I never, I never thought of myself as an artist, but it's, um, you know, because I love to do, I love to ink really great pencilers. So right. it's like, I don't even want to c- compete with them, but at conventions, I dreamt up, you know, me, I always say Albie is kind of me malsonified and I dreamt him up and then said, well, I'll do a, when I started working at the Academy of Art, I got inspired by the students and the instructors. And I said, I should, I should do a children's book, damn it. And that's when I did it. Will I ever do another one? I have no idea, but I'm so proud and happy that at least I did that one. You know, Mick, not too many people in their career path think about not just the work they're doing and they've done, but about like giving to that next generation, teaching people at the Academy of Art, creating children's books and things like that. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really amazing. And your humility is uh, about oh, your that incredible means- talent uh, is just like, it leaves me speechless. I, I, I'm. Thank you. I, you know, I love, I love what I do so much. Will I be working at DC comics in the next five, 10 years? Who knows? The answer I, is I, yes, Nick. I hope so because the whole thing about working with DC for 30 years is they're very good at keeping things in print. And that means residual money for me. Yes. As I get older and older, it's a little backup. It's something happening, you know, something. Well, something. They're, they're one of the only mainstream publishers or one of the few publishers and certainly the first to have that commitment to a backlist. Yeah. Of perennial graphic novels. And I wanted to say your Joker graphic novel, you showed the new cover of it. Yep. Um, by the way, far superior to the hardcover cover, in my opinion. A pretty crazy cover. Yeah, that's a crazy cover, man. I mean, I, it pops so much more. The other one was purple and sort of muddy a little bit. And like, and it was shrink wrapped with a dust jacket. So I just, people couldn't open I just it. noticed that I can. Ha! <laughs> oh, that's the. It's you actually matches up. You just gave us a thumbnail for this. Uh, for this I, and I'm, I'm going to post that on Facebook uh, today, too. Awesome. Well, wait a minute. I told you something else that I wanted to show you a little bit of art. Yeah. Let me bring this out real quick. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Original. So, um, I'm, I'm also working with Barry Kitson again. Oh, he's a, he's a fave of mine, too. So, this is to a new um, uh, kick-started book called the liberty brigade and it'll be 30 pages of me and barry and 30 pages of ron friends and joe rubenstein and about 10 20 pages of everybody else that's really cool that we love so it's a hardcover um public domain superheroes um stories and origins uh really fun you know we're you know fighting nazis and things like that you know and it's really wonderful to be working with Barry again because I I just always loved working with him in the old days when I worked on Legion of Superheroes with him. So is that on Kickstarter? This is. Uh, it's uh, called Liberty Brigade, and it's called what's the company called? Thrilling. Oh, I'm blanking on the company, but if you put in Liberty Brigade Kickstart, it comes up. Okay. And like Great. I say, the hundred page hardcover uh, should be out later this year maybe by the end of the year i think something like that we're almost, i think i'm almost done with uh, our 30 odd pages on it something like that but uh, oh, Mick, that is the perfect segue because like this is we're at the end of the interview but i really want to talk about the future of comics crowdfunding and comics and i would love to have you back in sometime uh, and, and and maybe some of those other creators just to talk about how things are changing from now where we're losing middlemen at a rapid pace. And now it's going directly from creators directly yep. to their fans via Kickstarter. Yep. Same thing's happening in the music industry. Um, it's if, if you have a fan base, you can pull this off on your own without a publisher. So it is, it is the way everything's going. Do you hear that DC? You hear yeah. that? Keep and the that, pros around while you've got them. Exactly. And that should make them change their, you know, the way they, the way they think about the business. They should think different about it because well, of the, how much good quality stuff's coming out that way. 
Absolutely. Well, whenever the focus, whenever they stop forgetting that this business and art form is based on the back of creators, it's not on the back of, it's not because they have these brilliant characters necessarily. It's that they keep increasing their game and pre bringing people in with talent that elevate. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the problem with, you know, I, I, I would think the thing that, that DC and Marvel worry about is when you come in and do a project for us, we want, we want to own it. We want to, we want more money out of it. Um, and as comic books are, you know, the, the amount of money that they're making as it goes down they should be thinking, in my opinion, they should be thinking, well, if we bring people in, good creators, and give them a giant chunk of the revenue, or at least an equal chunk of the revenue, there's going to be more great creators wanting to work with us, and they have rights to their characters. We're going to let you have the rights to your characters, but we're going to, you know, also work with you and make TV shows or movies out of them, you know? I don't understand. Well, I do understand. It's greed. Greed gets in the way. Yeah, money is like gravity. I've always said it, Mick. It's like a, it's like a force of nature that's out there and makes people move in ways they might not otherwise have moved. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, one other project. I'll give you a sneak. This is a real sneak peek. Yeah. Um, just starting it. Oh. Let me get the... Dr. Fate? Yeah, this is Mark uh, Mark Buckingham. I'm first time I've ever inked Mark Buckingham, so uh, we're doing a uh, Doctor Fate origin um, in uh, Justice League Dark. All right, fantastic. So ten, ten pages, just a ten page piece there. But I have never uh, inked over Mark before, and I, there's another one of the guys that I really love his work. So I'm gearing up at the moment. This is the first page I've hit, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm inking one of these great guys. Can can I pull it off? Because he inks himself. There's another guy. He's great. He can do all of it, you know? I have not been reading Justice League Dark, I'll admit, but I will be looking forward to that issue. I Mick look, you know, I didn't even know what it was. I just took took the project because they said, hey, Mark asked for it. And I was like, I'm there. If he wants me, I'm there. And so then, what kind of a, I mean, what kind of a signal of that is of your reputation in the industry uh, when you're getting, when, when, you get when requested I get guys like them. that, yeah, when I get guys like that ask for me, I get, I'm getting chills up my spine right now just thinking about that. Um, this guy's fantastic. He has, he doesn't need me, but he's given me an opportunity to work with him and it's, uh, I'm blessed. Well, I'm going to say, Mick, you take the work of great artists and you, and you do elevate it. You bring it. You bring a level of rigor and professionalism and just fun and quality and like attention to detail that yeah. not everyone does. That's what I strive for. And I strive for that phone call that the penciler goes, that's exactly what I was looking for. I, you know, going back to me saying I, I try to be a chameleon, I'm trying to give them what they're, you know, get into their head and say, oh, that's what they want. They want this there impossible to do but i can try you know I, can, I always try to do that i think you've succeeded mick thank yeah. you so much went, for the uh, time went into the supermarket the other day and uh had our i i go oh, i want some of those bags sell me those bags i have our art uh patrick gleason superman art on on our on shopping bags at uh do you get paid Subway. when that happens no no it's still fun but, though huh it's totally fun i mean you the, they they pay you for books, but they have they own the image rights and they can print it on anything they want. And it sure is fun when you come across it. I wish they in the old days they used to send you, you know, hey, we just published, we just made put your uh, your art on uh, t-shirts, so they'd send us a t-shirt or two. And then all of a sudden it was like, no, mm -hmm. no, s screw that, you know. I don't go know. Buy it. Go buy it. It bothers me. If they sent me a copy of the things they sent, they printed it on, I'd be happy. But then I go, that seems, oh, like, that seems like common courtesy and basic, but. Well, can what I say they own it? They own it, you know? Okay. Well, Mick, thank you so much for this time. I, I really appreciate it, man. You didn't have to do this. Hey. We don't have a huge audience here. I don't know how many books we're going to sell for you, but we're going to do our best. Doesn't matter. I love you, and uh, thank you for having me on as a guest, man. It was fantastic. Thanks, Mick. We'll, we'll, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Hey, thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, you might like some of my other videos, so check them out.
Don't forget to like and comment and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and ring that bell if you want notifications when we come out with new videos. Thanks for watching.